Welcome to Board Game Binge, the place where we bring you bite-sized, bingeable board game content from across the industry. I'm your host, James Staley, and in this episode, we're chatting with the one and only James Hudson, tabletop designer, developer, and creator of Druid City Games, which launched the popular titles Grim Forest, Sorcerer City, and Title Blades. James is currently the Senior Director of Tabletop for Skybound Tabletop, a division of Skybound Entertainment. James, welcome to The Binge. How are you doing? What up, y'all? How's it going? So, James, I know that you've done a lot of, uh, a lot of podcasts, a lot of interviews. People that follow the industry uh, know you quite well. There's some people listening that maybe don't know you. Um, you've really been part of some really large uh, Kickstarter campaigns over the past four years. The first one being the Barnyard Roundup is kind of where you started. I thought we could start off this chat just getting into your background. So where were you before this all started? Like where, where, where did you come from? Where did this all start? Sure, yeah. I, uh, I had an 11-year uh, career in marketing uh, before this where I, I did sales and marketing in the trucking and construction industries. So oh, wow. very exciting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And then how did you kind of, were you doing that on the side? So was it kind of uh, like in evenings or like uh, you have got your, obviously your day job in marketing, but how did that kind of then eventually evolve into the, the board game side? Yeah, I, um, I honestly just started playing board games um, probably six, seven years ago. And uh, I was a big Warcraft nerd that, uh, you know, really spent a lot of time uh, flunked out of college because of Warcraft and I had some buddies who said, you should come over and play board games with us. And I was like, I did not want to come play Monopoly with you. No, thank you. And they're like, we don't play Monopoly, just come play. And, um, you know, we, we played some board games. And I fell in love. And then I, I probably went to the same cycle that most people do, uh, do. You know, I was like, went to Barnes & Noble, bought every board game I thought that was interesting to me. Then found out that we had a board game store in my town that was just board games. So I went to that place and bought games from there. Uh, and went down the rabbit hole. Then I went to my first Gen Con, and I think I came back with about 75 games from that first Gen Con, which was just, <laughs> yeah, I ended up selling the majority of those because I didn't even get them played. It was one of those, you're way too hyper, you know, way too, thousand miles an hour. Um, but then, you know, I've always been, um, what is it, left brain, right brain, where you're creative and you like to do that sort of stuff. And I had, instantly had ideas for games that I wanted to do. And that's when I was like, well, Kickstarter lets you do it. This will be fun. It'd be really cool to have my name as I designed a game. And uh, I'd actually designed the game that we're about to launch onto Kickstarter at the beginning in January. It's called Bloodstone. Okay. But I knew at the time that that, was, that project was too ambitious for a first timer. Yep. And so I made Barnyard around up instead as a like, let me learn how to, how this industry works. Let's, let's make a game that I won't sink my family's savings and go bankrupt. Yeah. The, you know, in talking with, um, you know, other publishers or developers, this is a common theme we're hearing where, you know, people have, you know, there's many people out there, they design their own games and, you know, they have the lighter versions, heavier versions. And the advice I hear time and time again is pick a simpler game, cut your teeth, learn Kickstarter. Cause there's, it's a huge, huge learning curve. And then, you know, kind of once you, you get your feet wet, then maybe jump into the heavier game, the bigger game, the one that's going to need a lot more funding. Is that kind of like a fair thing to say? You know, I hate their path forward should be, right? That's, that's the, the beautiful thing about like even looking at somebody like Isaac who's like, well, here's Gloomhaven, you know? Yeah. That, that turned out all right for him. So, I mean, he had other games before, but like that, I think that was his first game as his own publisher. Right. And so you know, if you've got a great idea, like I, I can think of a few, like Arena, the contest, it did really well, has a big following. So I don't think you necessarily have to do it. Um, I know I've got a buddy who's working on a really huge, enormous game he's been working on for like three years, it's gonna have minis and it's gonna be dumb, named Ian Allen. And he's, it's, I mean, it's like, it's, it's a crazy game, yeah. but he, you know, he's just not interested in making anything else to learn the business. He's just gonna go with what he wants. And so I can respect that. And I think, I think there's a path forward for that too. Uh, for me though, I, I, you know, I felt more comfortable with that. And I thought, uh, with Barnyard Roundup, I had a really cool game too. So it wasn't like, let me just do this because it was like, well, I also have this game as well. Now it funded, uh, I think about $17,000. I think it was 516 backers, which is pretty strong, uh, for a first time Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and then when you look at the next game you did, uh, it was a little bit bigger, I guess. Eh? Just, just a tiny bit. Uh, we were at like $405,000 and 7,131 backers. Uh, the Grim Force, if case anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, it, it was a huge, huge game. Um, what was the big difference? What was there? There was something that kind of happened in there between uh, you know, the Barnyard game and, and the Grim Force. What, what was the big thing that happened? I think the big, one of the biggest things is, is that the audience that is on Kickstarter, they're not really looking for family games. Uh, that's uh, not, that's even, even today, like I think even now, actually, if I was brand new and launching Barnyard Roundup, I don't know if it'd be successful to three, four years ago when we launched it. So it really depends on the game makeup. And I, you know, I've had other games that I did as well. Like um, I think people also see the game mechanic and decide if that's something they want. And there's just more popular categories uh, like, uh, you know, Barnard Roundup being a bluffing game. That's one of those mechanics that's either hot or cold for people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we followed up after Grim Forest with Guardian's Call that was a smaller campaign yep. because people just saw the word bluffing. And again, it's hot, it's polarizing. Uh, you love them or you hate them. Um, same way with the real time games. We found out with Sorcerer City, you know, people were really turned off by that when they heard the word uh, words real time. So, you know, you, it's just things that you learn as you kind of go out and put products out into the market. Sounds chaotic. Uh, we talked to um, the, uh, the producer of uh, Pendulum. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, anytime I've, I personally, even my own game nights, when I hear about real time, it's like, Ooh, I don't know. That sounds a little chaotic. What if I'm not fast enough with my, I've got thumbs at night. I'm all thumbs. Am I going to, you know, not have a good time with the game? And uh, I think real time games are probably misunderstood for the most part, but you're right. I think sometimes the description is enough to, uh, to sometimes turn people off. So what was it about the other two? I think artwork is maybe something that, um, you know, if I look at the evolution of, of your games, mm -hmm. artwork has become more and more an integral part. Certainly uh, with the Grim Forest, I think artwork was a, was a massive component about that. Can you talk a little bit about how artwork has played a role in some of these games? Sure. You know, I've, for me personally, also coming from marketing, I, 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 I have a hard time getting behind something if it doesn't look good. And yeah. so, um, and I know art is subjective, but uh, at the same time, there is, certain levels of quality that you can say art has. So whether or not you think that piece of art from Magic the Gathering uh, looks good or not, or fits your taste, you know, it's high quality. You know that there's a very talented person behind it. And so I think, uh, you know, for art and for even, you know, it spills over into the components of the game. If I'm going to be sitting down and engaging with this thing for the next hour, I want it, I want it to be nice. I want it to, yeah. to, you know, speak to me from the table. I want people to walk by the table and go, what is that? What are you playing? Tell me about it. Uh, that's half our problem getting somebody just to sit down and be to want to learn a game. So, um, you know, if I can help people facilitate their gaming because it looks good and it has a cool presence on the table, then I think I'm, that's part of my job. Now, the artist you had was Mr. Cuttington, I guess, is who you've used on, I think, several of the titles. I think, was it four was the count? It was a three or four was the count I had. Uh, certainly high, high quality work. Um, the, the game designers, so the Eisners, um, mm -hmm. they've also been an integral part of a number of the games you had. Have you tried to kind of lean on where you've got success, lean on the same kind of team members? Is that kind of the, the general thing you've gone for? Or has it just kind of worked out that way? Well, I mean, I definitely think as creatives, you do find people that you ebb and flow with really well. And yeah. the Mr. Cunnington, which is actually a Canadian couple, uh, David and Lena, a husband and wife team. And their moniker is Mr. Cunnington. It's very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> I still call them the Cunningtons all the time because it's just easier. But yeah, um, That's what's on the board anyways, right? <laughs> and uh, Tim, Tim and his brother Ben are, are just phenomenal good people that are yeah. easygoing and easy to work with. And so you do kind of find your ebb and flow with certain people. Um, but you know, we're, we're constantly working with a different set of people and, um, diversifying our team is important to us as well. And, yeah. and, you know, getting different voices in to help us build our projects. I, I feel like you, you become stale if you have the same team over and over and over. Sure. So, um, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's a little both. Yeah. You, you do get comfortable with folks and you do like working with them and you know what you can expect from them, but also we, we try to keep new fresh projects coming in as well from other designers. You develop a little bit of a shorthand, I guess, when you're dealing with the same people uh, each time. Um, now, 
how did you go picking some of these games or, or, or choosing games to, to publish versus others? Did you have a certain process you went through or these just people you met at conventions or how, how did, how did it kind of come together? Yeah, it is funny. Um, I actually met Tim at that Gen Con that I was telling you about that I went nuts yeah. at, um, uh, or it was either the Gen Con after that, but I saw him walk on the floor and I was like, Hey, I had actually interviewed him uh, when he was releasing uh, the March of Ants. And that's a, a 4X kind of ant based game. It was like one of his first games. And um, he, I was like, Hey, if you got any games you want to show me, I'm thinking about signing a game or two to help, kind of on board this publishing company that I want to do. Uh, hey, we've got one thing done. And he was like, <laughs> okay, guy, I don't know. Sounds fine. You know, <laughs> and we met up later and uh, he showed little pig and um, you know, I really, really enjoyed the mechanic that he had there. And I was like, I could foresee this being a much bigger game. Like it was a very small game. Um, okay. And I was like, you know, I think if you bring in the whole, you know, and I pitched him on my idea. Like, let me bring in the whole fairy tale world. Let me get the Cuttingtons who would work with on Barnyard Roundup. I was like, I think they'll do a fantastic job bringing this world to life. Well, well, you know, it had the floors and the walls and the roof, but he yeah. had just had them in like wooden blocks, you know. I was like, we can make these full sculpts. They'll, it'll be awesome. Yeah, look and, cool. uh, you know, it took me a couple months to convince him because he was like, it's, it's risky to just sign your game with somebody who's a startup publisher, oh, yeah. uh, but it worked out. So how did you convince them? How did you convince them that, you know, you're the guy to go with? I paid him. <laughs> <laughs> Money talks. You Money know, talks, like, you doesn't know, it, eh? <laughs> I was like, hey, you're taking a risk on me. I'll pay you a higher percentage than what is, you know, kind of standard today. So yeah, you're taking a risk, but if it works out, you get paid more. I, and, uh, you know, I think that's the way, that's the way things should work. And so when did this become, um, like Druid City Games, when did it become kind of like a full-time company for you? It was, it was a little bit after, um, probably three to four months after uh, Grim Forest campaign. Because okay. at that point we were, it's really easy to, to work on one project at a time. And because yeah. they, they have this tale of like ideation, uh, design development, make the Kickstarter, launch the Kickstarter, run the Kickstarter, successful Kickstarter. Now we, now we develop on the back end to get it ready, manufacture, produce, fulfill, yeah. uh, retail. Uh, and so once you, once you kind of get through that first game and it's launched and you're done with the development, there's this big lull when you're like, you're working back and forth with manufacturer to make it, but it's like, you know, you're, you're pinging with them once or twice a week. It's not like an everyday 40 hour week job. So you're like, okay, time to make the next game and start the cycle from a different game. And um, when, once I started that second cycle for the next game, it was like, oh, now I've got two different buckets pulling me and I have a full-time day job. It's probably mm -hmm. time for me to get out of that and like try to make this thing go full out. Yeah, I think it's, um, it, you've got that, that product life cycle you're going through. And if you have several projects, I guess as long as they're kind of staggered, right? Then you, every six months or every four months, whatever your cycle is, you could be turning out another game. Yeah, I mean, I see, I definitely see a lot of negativity uh, in comments about like, oh, they're working on their other games. They're not even paying attention, especially if your project gets late, which we've had plenty of late projects. Uh, sure. So we get that quite a bit. And it, it, it really... That's not the case. Now, I'm not going to say that having other things in, on your, in your uh, bandwidth doesn't pull away from other things because that, that's just dumb. Sure. But, um, you know, the way that the cycles work is like you have these big ebbs and flows of work that need to be done on projects. And so, yeah, there might be two weeks where nothing, I'm doing nothing but Tidal Blades work. But then once I've got all that done and handed off to the, either the next contractor or the next you know, step in the process, mm -hmm. there's big lulls where there's no work to be done until I get that feedback or I get the next step in the process. And so you can be making other games in that time and you have to, I mean, to make, to make the product, the projects ready for the pipeline when you want to be able to launch them, yeah. uh, you've got to be working on multiple projects all at the same time. And I think people probably don't realize that that manufacturing, you're not just starting to figure out manufacturing once you've, your campaign closes, like you've worked a lot of that out most of that out uh, prior to the campaign closing. Hopefully you've worked out 99.9% .9 of it. And it's just, you're doing your finessing when you're going to uh, manufacturing. Well, it's one of the big things that we messed up on uh, with Tidal Blades and why it's a year late 
yeah. uh, from our proposed, you know, uh, delivery date is it was just a much bigger process than we had anticipated. And every step along the way, we underestimated how much time it would take to do each step. Mm. Um, not to mention that board games, especially with a high production value, are like really small engineering projects. Oh, so yeah. you've got, you know, you're designing a game and, and, and mechanics, but like fitting 200 plus components into a box in a way that is pleasing to everyone is very difficult. And you would, you'd be surprised at the little road bumps that come up along the way constantly. It's a constant like, hey, this doesn't work. We tried it the way that you thought. It doesn't work because of this. And then you go back and you ideate and you fix and then you test. And in between all those tests, it just, the time adds up and it adds up quick. The one I always look at when I, I see Kickstarters and they add minis as like, um, as a stretch goal. I'm always thinking in my head, okay, that box was sized to cubes or whatever you're using before you did the minis. I, I hope that there's two box sizes kind of figured out prior to that campaign, right? Cause you, gosh, that can really change not only the, the size of your box, your weight for shipping, um, you know, coin upgrade is another one. You see a lot of Kickstarter campaigns do coins as an upgrade. It's like, okay, that just added a lot of weight to that package. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, they've got some experience, whoever is working on it, that uh, they've kind of had the forethought that, okay, how are we going to accommodate that? And have we built that cost in there that's going to increase, uh, you know, in getting this out to our actual pledgers? I think a lot of uh, Kickstarter creators, you know, on the front end, you see, you see a big dollar amount. Oh, $405,000. Yeah. Wow, they're rich. Man, a lot of that money just gets eat up quick between production and fulfillment and shipping costs and taxes and import fees. And like you're like, oh, well, I've got five thousand dollars left over <laughs> all that money. You know, you don't even know until you kind of get to the end of it and you realize I, you know, there's a lot more costs. That I think that's why you've seen probably over the last year or two, uh, shipping costs. You know, at the beginning, it was pretty much you had to say shipping's free and you just have to absorb that shipping cost. Yeah. Well, people did that a, a time or two and you go, wait, I didn't, I barely made any money. Yeah. I made it made barely any profit. I have to charge the shipping. I have to pass that along because I don't make any money off shipping. If, if FedEx tells me it's going to cost me if you this box, I don't get a cut of that, right? Like I'm not marking yeah. that up. So in, in most cases we're marking it down and we're eating you know, $5 of that or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Now, when you, um, I think it's, it'd be important to talk a little bit about the relationship you have with uh, Skybound Entertainment. Um, how did that kind of come about? Like uh, there was a partnership in there and that evolved then more to uh, more of a direct relationship. Can you, can you talk about that and how it kind of sure. came together? So we were actually at Gamma. Uh, it is a, a kind of an internal industry trade show. And uh, I was there, you know, hawking Grim Forest and doing my thing, trying to get, you know, make relationships with, with distro and all the different touch points within the industry. And uh, I met this guy named Sean Kirkham from, uh, from Skybound. And their big thing was they were looking to expand. They'd done Super Fight and Red Flags and uh, uh, Death, Mary Kill, uh, Death, Mary, Death, Mary, Kill. Kill Mary, I don't remember that game. Anyway, it's a, a party games. And that was, they were looking to really kind of expand uh, their division in tabletop and get more into the niche hobby, uh, hobby games and that sort of thing. Yep. And uh, so we talked and uh, we ended up co-publishing Grim Forest together, which helped me a lot because then I had instant access into like mass retailers because they already had those relationships set up. And, you know, as a little guy coming along with one game, two games, it's really, really hard to get anybody to pay attention to that stuff. Oh, yeah. So um, it was just beneficial for both of us right from the beginning because they saw that I had a passion and vision for building a board game plethora uh, in catalog. And they, that's what they wanted to do to add to their ranks. And uh, certainly there'd be an audience they would come with as well, right? So with all the graphic novels and so forth, uh, were you able to tap into any other audience as well? Or You know, that's, that's, that's still an ongoing, I don't want to say struggle, but it's an interesting thing because you would think comics are, uh, are, are pretty, but board games are still pretty, a pretty niche boutique industry. Um, mm. you, you still have these hurdles that you have to overcome. And I think this is, you know, kind of even way outside of what we're talking about now. Right. That's but right. like people have these layers of 
experience from when they were a kid, right? They played Monopoly and they hated it. They played Risk and they hated it. They yep. played Scrabble and they hated it, right? Or they had somebody in their family that was n- not a good sport, right? And ruined it, made them look and feel stupid in front of people and in a crowd yeah. of people. So you've got all this anxiety that gets tied into the, I, just like when I told you at the beginning at the top, oh, my camera went off, let me hit it again. Uh, when at the top of the thing, when they were like, James, come play board games. And I'm like, I don't want to play Monopoly with y'all. Yeah. So I think we're fighting that uphill battle, not just with comics, not just at Skybound, but just the general public all over. So that's why I get really excited when I see these shelves at Target with actual games on it. Yeah. That, you know, that selection has gotten so much better that people are getting introduced to games that actually have some real good agency. And, you know, that's going to get them to go like, oh, what else is out there? And then you got acquired, right? So it started off with a relationship with Skybound and then they uh, acquired uh, Druid City Games and you came on then in charge of their, their game division. Is that kind of... Yep, that's there? exactly right. And so, you know, the, one of the reasons why I wanted to make this, uh, this step in the journey was, one, it's really, really hard to go it alone. Uh, small business, it, it, especially in uh, board gaming where you... I wanted to spool up several game projects but you, that requires a lot of capital and a lot of investment and a lot of resources. And uh, the other part is like Skybound has all these other divisions within the company. It's actually Robert Kirkman's company who created Walking Dead. And uh, he, you know, there's TV and film, there's comics, there's video games. They've, they've got all these divisions that were under one roof. And, you know, I really want to be able to kind of, again, couple back to that previous conversation. How do we help people? see that they can pull that that defense that defensive guard down and play board games just try a board game yeah Uh, my friend sues from you know the dice tower uh she's like there's a game for everybody you just gotta ask them enough questions and find out what they're into to find a game that would be perfect for them yeah yeah i always use the analogy of beer right when someone says they don't like beer i say well there's a lot of beer out there like you haven't tried them all you might actually like beer you just maybe don't like the ones you've tried Right. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of meetups. There's, and obviously with COVID right now, it's, it's tougher for people to get together than it was maybe a year ago, but it'll come back. And, you know, I always encourage people go to a local meetup group where, you know, they're doing board games and there'll usually be a table set up with a gateway game, right? Like a Zool or something super easy and light Euro style to get, get you kind of in, get you to get you to try the games. And once you kind of get that, that bite, right? Once you get that, that, that hook, man, it's a, uh, it, it's such a fun world to be part of. And uh, you just kind of want to, you know, explore the next game and it can go with the other side where you see people that I got a buddy that's good, literally got like 1500 games. Like it's almost become yep. a sickness right now. He's, he's collecting games like crazy, but it, uh, you know, it really becomes, uh, there's a lot of joy in it. Right. And people sleeping Absolutely. cards and collectabilities, you know, we talked with, um, you know, uh, Andrew Bosley last week. And, you know, there's another example of now there's people collecting games based on artwork and starting to say, okay, I want this artist's uh, type of games. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing, amazing community. And it's cool to see someone like yourself go from, you know, the very beginning and work your way, your way through now as part of, uh, you know, a large, um, a, a large business, but being kind of the person that's going to chart the path for this part of that company, yeah. right? These guys got a lot of intellectual property. They're going to want to, you know, crank out in different ways. And what better way to get a story out there, say in the walking dead or one of their other properties uh, in a board game environment, than you know, work with someone that's got experience taking immersive stories and building games around them and creating yep. an immersive experience. So I think that's uh, that's pretty cool. How, how does this process go from here? Like where, where does, Skybound, um, you've mentioned the one game that you, one of the first games you created, which is kind of next uh, coming up on Kickstarter. Um, but are you working on some of the, without giving too much away, that's uh, maybe confidential? Is there some of the properties that you guys are actually looking at creating games out of? Sure, yeah. We've actually got quite a few that we've already built or had um, prototypes, designs submitted for that we like. Yep. Um, it's the, one of the, the hard parts of working with uh, a team that's are especially if, like a comic book is still in rotation yep. is that that team is making a comic book every month. And so no that's boy. generally all of their bandwidth. And so like, um, you know, I've got a, I've got a game in front of us uh, for birthright. Birthright is a 
unbelievable. Uh, if you if you like comics, it's worth checking out, right? It's this high fantasy, awesome story of, and uh, I love it. And their game that I've got, I love it. I play the prototype for fun. And uh, I just, I have no idea when I'm going to be able to work that in just because that artist is busy and it's, you just, you can't pull them off the comic to do the art for the board game. So. Yeah. And how does, how have you guys now changed your, your Kickstarter approach? So, you know, if I go back to again, Barnyard Roundup, it's, Hey, you know what? Uh, if, if I don't get the funding, this thing's not getting made because I've got right. a day job and, and now this has evolved and, you know, you see some of your more recent campaigns, which are very robust you know, and I, I was actually, um, uh, when I was going through the different campaigns, comparing to the first one, to the one now, and just the components and the artwork and everything and the team around it is so much bigger, more robust. How have you taken some of this, um, this partnership that you've had now with Skybound and, and positioned it differently maybe for the Kickstarters going forward? Well, I think, I think the first thing to realize is that the Kickstarter is a very, flexible platform right it can it can work well for somebody who's the first project they've ever done barnyard roundup and it (laughs) also still works really well for big companies who are launching a big ip that they want you to get involved with yeah um the i think the biggest thing that kickstarter does it it allows fans to find fandoms right so like when i come across something that looks really cool uh i can i can support them early on now, for some reason, there's a lot of a lot of a lot of jadedness kind of gets built yeah. up around big companies using Kickstarter. But at the end of the day, any big company, two two to three projects failing away from being out of business. So, oh, yeah. especially in board gaming, being a niche a niche industry, like nobody. I, I said this all. I joke, make this joke. Nobody's driving Lambos in board gaming, right? Like yeah. this ain't video game money, y'all. This is this is. Uh, the margins are much thinner. And so when people get up in arms about big companies using Kickstarter, uh, you know, I've got a whole list of rebuttals for that. Uh, as I've been on both sides, I've done, I've been the little guy and now I'm a big company using it. And um, the, 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 the biggest thing I think is that because you do get the money up front and it reduces your risk factor, we're able to put more stuff, more content and more love into that box yeah. Like what I have for title blades would never exist if there wasn't Kickstarter. Would we have made a game? Probably, but it wouldn't have looked or anything like that deluxe edition. And so, you know, you get more stuff in there for supporting people. And in our case, like if you want, like if I want to go in and pitch somebody to make us a TV uh, and film animated series for title blades, I can take the Kickstarter numbers and use that as a, almost like, look at all the people that are interested in this. Let's do a comic. Let's do a book. Let's do animation. If I go in there with a $17,000 barnyard roundup, they're going to go, who cares? Uh, Obviously 500 people is not enough to do anything with. Yeah. So uh, all that to say is like, if you see something that you like, or you see a game type that you like, you see a creator taking a risk, uh, then, then reward them. Even if it's just a dollar, even if you're just throwing in just to support and build their back account, all those things add up. Yeah. It's almost like the modern day um, focus group, right? Like yeah. any large company and, it, and by large companies, again, there's, there's difference between large companies like Parker brothers and large companies as in a company that has a bunch of other properties that aren't even doing board games and, or they're doing board games, but now they want to kind of expand more into this immersive, uh, you know, tabletop environment. Right. It's a very different situation and it's still an environment where the backers can get involved. They can provide feedback. The company can actually act on that feedback. So you're getting a pre-read before you produce. Whereas the alternative, and again, I say it's these jaded people out there that, okay, what's the alternative? They just go to market and you take exactly what they're handing you. You have zero input. You have no way to provide impact. You just got to take it as it is. Right. So I think Kickstarter is a, is a great environment for that. You know, if, you know, if you look at yeah, anybody- it, it also helps the little guys. And again, this is greatly debated, but sure. I am in the camp that big companies with big audiences, having their users on the platform and being a part of the platform is beneficial for the smaller publishers. Sure. Because if there's more people swimming in the pool, that's more people that you can sell the lemonade to and, and the lemonade stand beside the pool. Right. Sure. Like that's, I 100% truly believe that I've went head to head 
with CMON, um, you know, Waking Realms, all those, the big dogs when it comes to million, million dollar campaigns. And I, I've never felt like, I mean, do you see a blip in the data? For sure. Like if CMON launches their campaign, I'll see a dip in some of our users, but they almost always come back. Sure. So, you know, it's part of the, we are a luxury industry. And if you make something that people think that they're going to enjoy, they're, they'll back it. But you, the onus is on you, the creator, to make something unique and tantalizing to make people want it. Like you can't just go in there with your run of the mill game that is one degree difference than some other game that's already on the market with very bland art and expect to be successful. I no, totally agree. And on that note, we just blasted through a half hour <laughs> like this. Uh, James, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on this podcast. Sure. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I wish you all the best with Skybound. I know you got a lot of fans, a lot of people following you, and uh, hopefully you get back on the podcast another time. Sure. Be, be happy to. Awesome. You take care, right? Cheers. All right. Later, y'all.